The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. Good afternoon, everyone. Actually, this work was done by Dr. Muntasri Billa, one of my former PhD students. He was supposed to present, but he's currently working in persons as a bridge engineer. He got a new baby, and the baby got sick, so he could not make it. But anyway, I have to present on behalf, and I am Dr. Shari Alam. I'm an associate professor in School of Engineering at UBC Okanagan campus. This is the outline of the presentation. As you know, the collapse of bridges during earthquakes happens frequently. For example, do you know where this bridge is located? Can you guess? <laughs> yeah, this bridge is located in Equator. So this is the recent collapse of, you know, like there was a large magnitude earthquake that took place and many people died and many more than 2,000 people got injured. So in order to now think about the person who actually designed this bridge, how does he feel, right? Definitely he will feel pretty bad. The bridge is owned by some DOT, whoever the owner is. They cannot also hold the bridge engineer responsible because he has followed as per the code. And maybe at that time when the bridge was designed, it was force-based design and there was no performance that was supposed to be achieved for a certain design level earthquake. So obviously, force-based design is not good for the owner. So the owner must have a say so that in case something happens that was not anticipated, he can hold the bridge engineers responsible. There have been now performance-based design being adopted, for example, in Ashto, and many other different countries are adopting this. And here we define performance in different ways. For example, if you are looking into bridge piers, we can define for design-level earthquakes based on how important the bridge is, whether it will be experiencing cracking or yielding or spalling or crashing, right? For example, I am from Canada, so recently Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code has adopted, prescribed this performance-based design, and this is one of the example of different type of bridges like lifeline bridges, major road bridges and other bridges. What kind of performance you'd like to have? And also it talks about different seismicity levels. Say for example, the worst case scenario is one in two, four, seven, five year return period earthquake. But also if you look into the performance based seismic design, the question is, is it enough to protect our investment? Because all our bridge structures, these are huge investment for a city or a country. Now, if we look into the conventional structures, you define a performance limit, but at the end, when a large earthquake hits and when there is huge seismic demand, it will experience large drift, large permanent displacement, and eventually you have to replace the structure. So it's a huge economic loss. And field studies after Kobe earthquake 1995 showed that if the structure experienced more than 1% permanent damage or residual drift, you eventually have to replace the structure. And if you look into the conventional structures, why we are experiencing this permanent damage, you all know that when we use reinforced concrete structure, we use steel as a reinforcement. When you have large seismic displacement demand, you have large residual inelastic strain. So after it is being unloaded, you will have large residual strain, and that gets accumulated right over cycles and then that causes your permanent displacement. But think about if we have such a material which can actually undergo large elastic deformation, but when the load is gone, it can actually recover most of its strain, then this permanent displacement that we are encountering that is causing collapse of structures, we can eliminate those. Such a kind of material is super elastic shape memory alloy. Those who actually were present in the first part of our sessions, you must have seen some videos as well how it works. And shape memory alloy has two different forms. I'm not going into the details. It has shape memory effect, and the other is super elasticity. So shape memory effect after large elastic, it will act like a regular metal, but after your large residual strain, you can heat it up to recover your strain. So it will almost go back to your origin. And super elastic form, if your ambient temperature is actually more than austenite finish temperature, then it will show automatically super elasticity means you don't have to apply additional energy or heat to recover your residual strain. 
So here in this particular work, objective is to, if you are using SMA as reinforcement in your concrete bridge pier, you have to define the damage states to actually have a framework for performance-based design. And here we want to propose that since for now, displacement-based design is mostly adopted and in terms of different performance, but here we want to propose residual drift-based performance. So that's what our main objective is. When we talk about shaping alloy, we have different types of alloys that are available. The most popular one is the nickel-titanium one, almost equiatomic nickel and titanium. And as you know, like nickel and titanium, both are expensive metals, so nickel-titanium will be very costly. There are also some other alloys like copper-based, as you can see, copper aluminum manganese, copper aluminum beryllium. Copper is cheap, so those are cheaper. And also, recently in Japan, they have developed some iron-based shaping alloy and those are actually much cheaper compared to nickel titanium based. So most of the works that have been done is mostly on nickel titanium and only few works have been done on copper based and iron based alloys. So this shows the super elastic behavior of this material under cyclic load, under cyclic tension as you can see that all of them shows flagship hysteresis and some of them their mode loss of elasticity, strength and also recovery strain is different. For example some of them I can show you later on that some of them can go up to large strain level and they can have much larger recovery strain. Recovery strain means they will go. I'm not showing you the actual stress strain behavior. So if I go up to rupture, the shape memory alloy will show like this. It will go like this and then it will have a plateau and then it will fracture. But if you go beyond a certain strain level, then you will lose its super elasticity. So we want to limit it within its recovery strain so that it can always come back to the origin. That's our purpose, so that we can use it in structures and in seismic regions. So their recovery strain of each of the alloys is a little bit different. Here, we would like to define most of the performance-based damage states. We would like to go in terms of drift rather than ductility. As you can see, the materials have different mode loss of elasticity, and compared to steel, which is our regular reinforcing metal, steel has much larger mode loss of elasticity compared to all these alloys. So definitely when you have similar kind of reinforcement ratio, if you look into the pushover response, you will see that yielding will be taking place much sooner in steel reinforced structures because it has much higher mode loss of elasticity, kind of steep curve, and then it's yielding. Whereas shape memory alloy, all of them has lower mode loss of elasticity, which means they will be going to larger drift before it yielded. So that's why, although they may have similar deformation capacity, when you find out the ductility, it means you are dividing because your ill drift for SMA infrastructure is much larger. So when you divide, you will see that you are losing much larger ductility for uh, SMA infrastructures. So that's why we would like to go in terms of drift because they have similar drift capacity. So here we would like to develop framework for different performance limit states, so I'll go into the details. So here, first of all, since we have different types of SMA available, we will select several of them and then we will design a particular bridge pier with different options of SMAs and we want to make sure they have similar kind of capacity in terms of moment or load carrying capacity and we will select an ensemble of earthquake records. The bridge we considered is located in Vancouver. So then we perform incremental dynamic time history analysis of all those bridges with different SMA reinforcements and then we will capture the different performance limits in terms of strains. And then we will develop the pushover response curves and compute the median 5% and 95% curves. And then we will obtain the drift limit at different performance levels and determine the suitable distribution. And then eventually we will propose where an equation, since we can relate your maximum drift and we can also capture the residual drift, so we will propose an equation that if you know the maximum drift, you can also predict what will be the residual drift. And based on the residual drift, you can actually go into the performance limit, displacement-based design. Because in the displacement-based design, you have a target displacement. But here what we are doing is we will have a target residual drift. So from the target residual drift, when you have an equation that relates to your maximum drift, you can directly go to residual drift to maximum drift, then you know your maximum drift demand. And based on that, you can follow the direct displacement-based design method. Here, we are considering five different types of SMAs. So the first two are nickel-titanium, 
And then the third one is iron-based SMA. Number four is the copper-based SMA, and this is another iron-based SMA. And if you look into their mode loss of elasticity, you'll see that copper-based SMA has much lower mode loss of elasticity, whereas both uh, iron-based, they are very similar. And uh, this one, iron-based, is about 100 gigapascal, so half of steel. And the other iron-based SMA is about one quarter of the steel. So these are the material properties, and the bridge pier that we have considered, it is about 9 meters tall, and all of the bridge piers we have designed with different 5 SMA bars, we consider the constant diameter, and number of longitudinal V bars, we also consider the same, 48 number of bars. And then only the diameter of the bar are different. So this is the design where you can see that we have used equal number of bars, but only their diameters are different. Every other thing are the same. So this is a moment curvature response, and you see that almost their capacity is very similar, and this is the pushover response. And as you can see that SMA5, which is the iron-based one that had higher modulus of elasticity, so that has higher stiffness as shown by this curve, where it shows that a little bit higher stiffness compared to the other SMAs. This is a numerical study where we considered these standard material models using fiber elements. Then we validated it with some experimental results. The first one was SNL Enforced Compute Bridge Pier Shake Table Test performed by Dr. Saidi at University of Nevada, Reno. And the other one was by Tresta. It's a beam reinforced with SMA and our cyclic loads. Both these models, what we have seen, that our model can predict very accurately the base shear, maximum base shear, and the drift demand, and also the residual drift within 5 to 10 percent accuracy. Now, according to the Canadian Highway Bridge Design Code, it prescribes three levels of earthquakes. So these are the design spectrum, and also we consider 10 earthquakes that are actually prescribed by seismologists. The way we selected the ground motions are the PGA over PGV value has to be around 1. That's how we selected our 10 ground motions, and we matched them with the design spectrum for 2%, 10%, and 5% in 50 years return period. So these are the proposed damage state framework. Here, the first damage state, we are considering immediate functionality, where it is the onset of hairline cracks. The second one is the yielding of longitudinal bar, and the third one is spalling, and the fourth one is the core crushing of concrete. So here, we have done incremental dynamic time history analysis, and then what it gives you basically is the base shear versus drift of all these points. So for each curve, we have 200 points, and the red curve showing is the median, and these are the 5% and 95%. Then we have actually 200 values for yielding and spalling and crushing at 2% in 50 years, and these graphs are for the SMA Enforced Concrete 1. So we have similar graphs for all five SMA Enforced Concrete columns. And we also have looked into the distribution of yielding, spalling, and crushing, as well as cracking. And these are the results. If you look into the cracking, you will see that because your cross-section is the same, all of them have almost the same cracking rate. And this follows almost a uniform distribution. And for yielding, if you look into these demonstrations, you will see that these are all two nickel-titanium-based alloys, and they have similar kind of drift level for yielding, very close. And SMA3, that has much higher, you can consider it as the austenite to martensite transformation level kind of yield strength. So that is much higher compared to the other ones because its FY value was about 700 megapascal, whereas the other ones were 400 up to 500, and one was 200. So this one has much higher drift. It means because of its higher yield strength, it has to go to higher drift level, right, to reach the yielding. And for SMA5, it has much higher modulus of elasticity, almost half of steel. That's why it reaches much earlier. The yielding reaches much earlier. And we have seen that it follows the log normal distribution, as you can see for other reinforcing bars, for regular steel as well. For the spalling, the only difference you see, like, definitely, as you know, that as you progress, the spalling will First, you will have cracking, then yielding, and then spalling. But for SMA3, you will see that this actually occurs earlier than yielding. That's the difference. It's because your SMA3 has much higher FY value. So that's why it occurs the other way, where your spalling takes place sooner than yielding takes place. And this follows the normal distribution. And then the crashing, actually, if you looked in the crashing, it, we found that it follows gamma distribution. And then we wanted to develop the fragility curves in terms of residual drift. 
When we talk about residual drift, we have looked into many literature, and some literature suggests that if the residual drift is about 1.25%, then it needs to be replaced. And many field-level data actually shows that if the residual drift is about 1%, then it needs to be replaced. And also, we have found from field investigation that if the residual drift level is about 0.25%, then if it exceeds 0.25%, then it is no longer maybe immediately serviceable. It needs some work. So we have defined four damage states based on damage state. One is 0.25%, and the collapse is 0.1%. And in between, we have defined damage state 2 and damage state 4 as 0.5% and 0.75%. And based on those damage states, we have plotted our fragility curves in terms of residual drift. Then we looked into the 50% probability of accidents of those damage states. And we took those values for all these graphs. And if you present them, you'll see one thing I should mention that when we considered the residual drift damage states, we ensembled all the data points for all five SMA reinforced concrete bridge spheres. It's not like we looked into one individual type of SMA. Rather, we put all of them together, and then we can fully define our damage states in terms of probability accidents for different return periods, and we see that as your magnitude or spectral acceleration demand is increasing, your damage state is gradually shifting and increasing a little bit. And those are the values, and you can see that for the collapse from literature, what we have seen is in between 1 to 1.25 percent. So it is also showing from 1.04 to 1.22 percent. Then what we did that we have a huge amount of data for where we can correlate the maximum drift with the residual drift, and then we actually did a lot of factorial analysis. I am not showing here in details. We have done fractional factorial analysis, and we ran lots of simulations, and we tried to identify like what are the parameters that actually affect your residual drift. And what we found that mostly the maximum drift and your steel strain, those are the values actually that eventually affect your residual drift. So in order to propose the equation, if we consider those two values, that will give you very good prediction. So eventually then we did come up with this equation, and then we have only not too many data available. There are maybe six, seven tests available in the literature where SMA is being used as reinforcement in the plastic in the region. So if we plot them together with this data, you see that it can predict pretty accurately the residual drift. Actually, our next level of the study is we are actually developing a framework based on this residual drift, how you can, when you have a target residual drift, design your bridge piers with different types of reinforced concrete. And that's all. Thank you.